Hey guys, this is Dr. Aeronautics. This is going to be a quick one, and it better be a quick one, because I actually didn't connect my yoke for this. We are going to uh, go over the external area of the aircraft real quick, and then we're going to uh, do a full overview of the panel. So I'm just going to go about this real quick, uh, just so that you can see everything here. In the back, it's kind of almost impossible to see right now, but uh, underneath the, there you go, the wing there is the exhaust for the scramjets. Uh, just above it here, you have the exhaust ports for the two main engines. Um, the Ravens, the vertical stabilizers with the Ravens, that's where your rudder control is. I don't have control of the ship right now, so I can't um, manipulate it right now. Uh, the horizontal stabilizer goes across the back, and on either side, that's where your elevators are. Uh, actually, technically, they're um, elevons because they're also ailerons. Uh, the positive pitch axis uh, RCS jets are back here too. We've got six of them. Now I'm going to continue over to the side now. Okay, so up on top, uh, the areas there, those are just fuel vents, so there's not really anything to mention there. Uh, just in front here, this door is the uh, retro rocket door, so that will open whenever you want to run the retro rockets. Up on top, you have your fuel hatch, that's where you uh, refuel from. Even higher up, you have your crew hatch, that's a little bit further forward though. Um, to reach your crew hatch, you obviously just climb straight up this striped pattern here and don't step on the areas where it says no step and climb down the ladder. This big door here is uh, the bay door. We'll explain a little bit more about that later. And then you have your uh, negative pitch as well as um, negative uh, roll axis RCS jets here. Uh, after that you have the airlock and then uh, more negative pitch jets here. Positive, uh, positive uh, yaw jets. Uh, continuing around here, now we have the retro rocket. Again, there's also another way that you can get into your crew hatch here. Continuing further back, we now have the uh, main engine again. And you'll see this area that says locks in the back. This is your liquid oxygen hatch. That's where uh, oxygen gets refueled from. And there's two, two doors which are not apparent right now that are for your turbo packs. I'll explain a little bit about that later. And then uh, in the back, pretty much everything else is the same. Uh, more pitch uh, as well as y'all jets. Uh, and if you use them oppositely, you can actually get roll as well. So it's a little bit nice being able to do that. Okay, we're going to head inside now because I'm getting tired of explaining things on the outside. Okay, uh, we're inside now. So we've got three... Um, three camera displays and we have four panels. So you have your 2D, you have your 2D panels uh, for one view, your other view is your virtual cockpit, and your third view is external, which uh, we sort of just demonstrated a little bit earlier. So for virtual cockpit, you've got the, uh, the pilot, you've got the co-pilot, and then you've got every seat in the house, so that's all 12 seats back here. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, these seats back here are actually really great for looking out the hatch. I uh, see there's no ladder. This door continues on into the uh, cargo bay and we'll take a look at that a little bit uh, sooner and then if I from this position to move around you basically use the control arrow keys that's how you uh, navigate now if I go to the front left or the front right uh, seats if I do a control left arrow or right arrow this will actually place me in the airlock itself so if I widen my field of view you'll actually see we're in the tunnel itself. So this is actually how you board the craft. This is the outer airlock door right now. And uh, if we were docked with the space station, you would actually see the outer hatch of the space station right now. So that's just of, of note. Okay, so for the four panels you have, you have the um, payload, panel, you have the upper panel, the middle panel, and the lower panel. Uh, most of what you're going to be doing is going to be on the middle panel, but we'll just basically start with each panel and go across. So we start up at the left, you've got your logo. Um, we've got the master warning system and master warning lights. You can test those. Uh, if there is an error uh, or an alarm that happens, you'll get a master alarm right here. It's just exactly like Apollo. System reset. If you push the button that resets it, that will hush the alarm, but you'll still see uh, the uh, illuminated warning light um, staying active. So this is unique to the XR2. Well, technically the XR fleet, the Delta Glider 4 did not have this. Um, or did it? It has an EPU. Yeah, I believe it has an APU as well. Uh, but unlike the Delta Glider 4's APU, uh, the XR2's APU is not designed to run continuously. So when you're done with it, you need to shut it off. So that's how you turn it on and off. It has a characteristic uh, hum to it. And then you have your controls here. So your bay door controls, this opens and closes your nose cone, your inner door and outer door of your airlock. If your airlock is closed, you can evacuate or pressurize your airlock here. If I deploy the air brake, you will see in the back, the ailerons will actually open. Uh, the cabin hatch up top, which is currently open, is closed using this button. We've demonstrated the radiator before using this button. You can also open your retro and hover doors here, um, which will reveal the uh, engines here. Going back inside, I forgot to mention the scram door inlets. They are right here, uh, bottom center. So that's how your scram jets will get their air. Do not forget to close this door when your scramjet temperature which is right around here, uh, middle right, starts to get hot or you will overheat. Uh, landing gear is controlled right here. You can turn your navigation lights on and off. You're right here. You have a mission elapsed timer, which will start when, um, when the wheels lift off the ground and it will not stop and you need to be landed or docked in order to reset the timer. You also have two interval timers as well that you can start and stop and reset at your leisure. Press one to start, press one to stop, press one to start again, and you press information and hold to reset. APU running. Over here is a system status display. All important messages are gonna show up here. We just received an alert that the APU running is running with no load. What that's telling you is we have the APU on and we have it on for no apparent reason. We're not using it. Things that need to use the APU are your doors, uh, as well as your hydraulics, such as landing gear and air flight control services. So if I turn it off and then try and 
close the scram doors, you'll get a no external line pressure or a uh, no hydraulic pressure warning. APU offline. There you go. So that's what happens if you try to close that. Uh, I will also talk about the interlocks here. So if your APU is on and uh, it's not going to work because we're in an atmosphere, but basically envision us in space, right? So let's pretend that I have my inner door open and I want to open my outer door as well. Well, in space, that's a bad thing because your craft is full of air. If I open the doors, it's going to, we're, we're going to go vacuum, which is really bad. When I say really bad, that means death within about 30 seconds. So, to cause that... Warning. Airlock safety interlocks disabled. You just press that button, and then you can open both at the same time, and uh, reverse, uh, produce a reverse thrust enough to save a uh, stranded astronaut from the surface of Mars, but everywhere will go vacuum. Information. Airlock safety interlocks APU enabled. Running. I've never used that before. I don't know why you would want to use it uh, other than for debugging or error purposes. I suggest never using it. Same goes with the cabin hatch. Although really with the cabin hatch, you do not ever want to be overriding unless you are on Earth because you can't dock this to anything. Um, this hatch is completely useless outside of the atmosphere. Okay, um, so I've skipped over some of the stuff in the middle. We'll talk about the payload camera view in a minute, but uh, in the middle you have your crew loadout. Currently there's only one person on board, so I can't really do anything with him. If I do EVA, he'll leave the craft. Information. APU running. So you'll notice when we started, we were actually controlling a UMMU and we were walking around and then we got up to the airlock and pressed the E button and entered the craft. So to get back out again, do EVA. Egress successful. So now there's no one on board, which means if I try to control the craft, nothing happens. Uh, it might not be clear, but I'm actually trying to click these buttons right now. So I'm just clicking around and nothing is happening because no one's on board. So if I now select my UMMU with, by pressing the F3 menu, here I am. I'm going to take my suit off. It comes on uh, by default, but I know that this is Earth. So I shift X to get my suit off, perfectly safe. And here I am pretty much right outside the craft where I started. Um, I can walk around just like I did before, uh, but we're moving on to greater things. So I'm actually going to go back in, just press E. Uh, that didn't work so well. Uh, it did work. I was just on an external view. Okay. So you got the ingress successfully message, and uh, we are all set. Just above that, uh, I need to turn the HUD off to display this. Uh, you will note the uh, angular velocity for roll pitch and yaw uh, and angular acceleration and torque. So your angular velocity is simply how fast you're turning. Your angular acceleration is whether or not you're starting or stopping your turn. Obviously, the more, the more force in the jets you use with a joystick, the higher um, acceleration meter you're gonna get. Information, APU running. I don't really use this all that often except maybe docking and during re-entry. And your torque is simply the force that the craft is experiencing when you're rotating around. Okay, over here uh, to the right, you have your scramjet temperatures. Um, I think those function but I find no reason to use them because you have scramjet temperatures down here. And that's the upper panel. So now we're onto the middle panel. 
Uh, starting over here on the left, you have your HUD, so you can put that in orbit, surface, or docking mode, exactly the same as the um, uh, stock Delta glider, There's no difference there. We have a tertiary HUD, which will display your system status display on glass, which is really nice. When you have an autopilot active or you have one selected... Information. APU running. You know, I don't hear it. Sometimes I have that issue where you egress and ingress and you don't hear that characteristic noise. Normally, um, going in and out doesn't fix it, but when you'll power it off, you'll hear the and then you'll hear it restart if we were to start it again. So yeah, um, that's one of the reasons why they do the APU running is because I wouldn't have caught that otherwise. But uh, it's an autopilot status light. Uh, I don't want to move right now because we've got some lines connected, but uh, this will flash green when you have an autopilot running. Here are your attitude control autopilots. So you've got pure rotation prograde, hold, uh, orbit normal hold, attitude hold. Um, we'll go into those in future episodes. Airspeed hold, that's a new one that you haven't seen before. Uh, retrograde, orbit normal minus, and descent hold. That's another normal one. Or, uh, uh, <laughs> that's a normal one. Wow, that's another one that we haven't seen before yet. You can control uh, pitch trim right here. So that's using the uh, insert delete keys. Uh, if you need to use trim, it will basically ever so slightly increase or decrease the pitch of your ailerons and reduce the back pressure that you need to hold. If I turn the HUD on now, uh, you can notice that I can actually adjust it using these brightness settings. I don't normally fiddle with it. And to be honest, I mean, the only thing that it really affects, if you'll notice, is it's these extra ones here, like the doors and the gear and the distance between the nearest base. Um, yeah, I, I don't really have a use for that. The only reason to use that would be like if I were orbiting a gas giant planet that happened to be rainbow and none of the colors, which can be changed using this button, were working, then I could just do that to change it to black. But again, information I never that. APU running. Here you've got your two multifunctional displays, no difference from the stock Delta Glider. All your buttons are integrated here in your MFD screen. Uh, next is your main engine control. So this is mouse clickable. I'm not gonna click it, obviously. Uh, you've got two axes of gimbal in the rear. And a center button. And you've got two at the main engines. Uh, if you do center, that sticks in the center. If you do div, what that will do is it will put one on the left and one on the right. And what will happen is you'll enter a rolling motion. So that can be useful as well. If I set them to auto, then what will happen, and I normally don't use auto mode, as I start to turn, if I try and yaw, I'll get some gimbal effect with it and it'll make my turn more powerful. That's really useful if you're in a very high gravity or high uh, density atmosphere. So I'm gonna go ahead and reset those using the center button and turn the automatic control off. Uh, hover engines, you can bias front and back, but be very careful using this because if you don't, you'll go into a hairier spin and go upside down. You don't want that. Uh, same with the scramjets, you have a uh, pitch up or pitch down in the center. You don't have bi-axis control though, so just be mindful. Um, I find that it's okay to use the elevator trim, but that's, I don't think it's as, as efficient as using the, Information. the tram gimbals. APU fuel 90%. So what you want to do is you want to adjust the 
the scramjet gimbals um, so you can get as close as possible. And now that I forgot about it, you know, you can adjust these and there we go, that's a div. So if I go ahead and center that, that'll return them back to where they were. There's a few buttons that are up here that are also down here, like for example, the retro doors, the hover doors, uh, the scram doors, the radiator, the air brake, the landing gear, those are all things that are on the upper panel. Here's your mission interval timers again up here, as well as your mission elapsed time. Here you've got your fuel display, so this is your uh, fuel in percentage in a graph form and then in a digital readout and here's your fuel in kilograms for your main RCS and scramjet fuels. Uh, your main and your RCS fuels are cross feedable, your scram is not. Below that is your engine display. This is extremely important in an atmosphere. Basically you have your efficiency where 100 is the full ISP or vacuum. You're getting the biggest bang for your buck. The thicker the atmosphere gets, the less effective rockets become. So you'll notice this triangle going down and that's basically say, hey, whatever thrust we're getting in space, we're getting about 79% of that in the atmosphere. If we went to Venus... Information. APU running. All right, that's getting annoying now. Here you can shut down the APU from here as well. Um, if we were going to Venus, uh, there would come a point where we go through 50, 25, and there's a point of no return. Uh, there will be a point where our outside air pressure will become higher than the nozzle pressure on the inside, which means if you turn the engines on, they'll flow backwards into the fuel tank. And that's not good at all. So basically what it means is two things. One, sulfuric acid is getting into the tanks. And two, I'm doomed to crash land on Venus. Except I'll be landing so slowly that um, I'll uh, just kind of touch down because of how dense it is. Um, but once I touch, I'm going to stick because the... Um, if the rubber survives the sulfuric acid bath, it's going to melt upon contact with the surface. Okay, so um, that being said, your thrust reading in kiloton kilonewtons here, or, or your thrust rating in kilonewtons is right out here. That's your current, not your maximum. You have a G-meter here. Uh, acceleration in the x-direction is your side-to-side, -side. so that's your... Um, vomit axis on a roller coaster that's the one where if if you're if your um, your car mate or car pull mate or whatever you want to call them is like turning the wheel left and right and it's giving you a headache and giving you nausea that's the X direction uh, the Y direction this is a little bit different than normal that is the um, that's the vertical, even though you would think the Z is different. So, gravity on Earth is 9.8 meters per second squared, so 9.797 meters per second is exactly what you'd be uh, expecting. Uh, on an air, aircraft, if you're on an airliner and you're doing a takeoff and the plane rotates and then all of a sudden you feel that upward motion, you feel heavier for a second, and then you stop feeling heavier and the gear starts coming up, you hear that bang. That's your Y acceleration going up. When an airplane makes this, initiates its its descent at the end of its cruise, and you feel that woozy feeling, you're getting lighter. It feels like you're falling for a second, and then it's okay. Or you're in an elevator that starts off really quickly. That's your Y acceleration going down very quickly. This has negative readouts, and you tend to get negative readouts when you're doing really bad reentries. Your Z axis is your forward and your backwards, which means basically that's your Tesla getting pressed into your seat as you rocket forward, or you fly forward because the light turned yellow and your driver stinks, so you just immediately slow to a stop. Um, or even worse, your driver is so bad that they don't see the semi in front of you and you 
make a deceleration at 300 meters per second squared and end up in the hospital. Let's hope that one doesn't happen. Below that, you have your ever important uh, multi readouts. Um, this has a name for it. I think it's the, it's like secondary functional display or something, but it displays a ton of stuff. So we're gonna start with uh, zero. That's the first display. There's 10 settings here. This is an autopilot for uh, airspeed, which I'll explain a little bit later. Remember I told you uh, the Z axis was how much you're being pressed into your seat. Well, this is the maximum acceleration that our engines can produce, which is slightly over one G of acceleration. It's about 1.3 Gs of acceleration. Um, basically, uh, it's the same amount of gravity acceleration as my Minecraft world on my Super Earth Gaia. Um, more on that later. Uh, you're going to get pressed into your seat. That's the most the engines can do. Okay, moving on. Descent, hold autopilot. Uh, the hover maximum acceleration is 0.787 meters per second squared, which means that if we take off, we're going to accelerate away from the Earth at 0.787. Sounds slow, right? You're going less than a meter per second upwards. Yeah, except for the fact that we're on the Earth. If we were on the moon, that would be about six. And if we were in uh, orbit, it would probably be about seven. You have an attitude hold autopilot, which I've used for re-entry. I've demonstrated that before, but we'll, we'll go into more detail. This is the most important readout of all. It's the re-entry uh, temperature display. Uh, you can display the temperatures in Celsius, Fahrenheit, or Kelvin. Um, you have a scale here reading between uh, absolute zero and uh, the top of the red arc is about 2050 Kelvin or um, sorry 2050 Celsius that's where uh, the temperatures turn white and if you go off this scale it means that whole failure could occur in the next eight seconds so yeah don't go into the white zone you'll notice I went to the white zone last time um, that was on the fringe of exploding so be very careful I did it because I was about to run out of fuel but that's also because I didn't do mission plan so just note that Okay, now on the right scale is a coolant that is reading, uh, if I change it, 31.2 degrees. And you'll notice on the right side of the screen here, coolant temperature, 31.2. We'll explain that a little bit later. Okay, I have a backup uh, attitude indicator right here. Fairly straightforward. It's like your same one in an airline or, I mean, technically a Cessna even because uh, they have glass instrument displays now. Do you have a dynamic pressure readout here? It's the exact same thing as uh, this one on the surface MFD, except instead of reading Pascal, it reads kilopascal, and it doesn't start reading until you get more than 50 pascals. So I tend to use this for uh, re-entry and use it for the scramjet uh, use, as well as um, when to and to not open my radio. Your slope here uh, basically gives you your current pitch. Uh, the angle of attack is the difference between your prograde velocity vector and your current pitch angle uh, relative to the incoming airstream. High angle of attack speed stall, and they are also used for re-entry and landing. You have another way to turn your APU on here. Uh, this I didn't mention here is your APU uh, fuel tank mass in kilograms. Below that you have your slip indicator. So when you're when you're making a turn, this is akin to an aircraft turn coordinator. So if you um, turn using uh, ailerons and you don't use your um, and you you don't use your uh, rudders at all. That is a, um, that's a slip. If you overuse your uh, rudders, that's a skid. So the slip indicator, basically when you're making a turn, if you keep that right along zero, you're getting your most fuel efficient turn. You're using the right amount of rudder. 
Okay, under that is the left and right scramjet diffuser temperatures. So the limiting factor on scramjets is as they compress the air, the air heats up. Uh, the faster you go, the more that compresses, the more powerful the engine gets, but also the more it heats up. Somewhere around Mach 20, you'll reach about 7,000 Kelvin. That's like 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. This is, you know, ridiculous, crazy alien technology. We're talking about a metal plate that's 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Not even a tungsten filament gets that hot. Um, so when you get to 7,000, you have to shut the scram doors. If you just turn them off and keep accelerating, guess what? You're still compressing the air. The temperature's still going up. If you go into the red zone, it's bad. If you go past the, um, past the red, it means that hull failure could occur within eight seconds. And just like a bad re-entry, you can explode and die. You have a static pressure readout right here. Uh, right now it's reading 101.2979, which is a little bit interesting because the standard atmospheric pressure is 101.3250. Um, uh, which is not reading right now. But it might be a little bit realistic because um, we are not on the ocean. We are actually about f six miles from it, uh, which means we're probably at about uh, um, 15 feet above sea level. So that might be realistic. In fact, uh, you know what? That might be reading... <laughs> that because of the difference because of the difference between the ground and the pressure sensor which might be like eight feet i know my phone pressure sensor uh, can tell the difference between when it's at when when my phone is at my feet versus at my head if you can believe that okay below that we have the wing load indicator that's very important when you're making high speed maneuvers and when you're coming out of re-entry uh during what's called dropout so you're going transitioning from your high angle of attack to run like an airplane you don't want the wings in the yellow or the red the rings go in the red uh, pretty straightforward everything that's left of the main engine here and everything that's right of the starboard main engine here folds in half and comes off and then we're basically a um, ballistic missile Oh yeah, and your uh, elevons, which you kind of need for control, are here and here. Not saying it's impossible to um, to land the craft in that kind of scenario, but it's going to be really tough. Second multifunctional display is here. Uh, multi uh, mission warning system is here. System exactly reset. the same deal. So now your secondary HUDs, you have secondary HUDs. Uh, now, unlike the, um, unlike the, uh, well, I guess the XR uh, or the Delta Glider 4's ones are uh, targeted, but basically uh, one is typically used for re-entry because you, here you have your uh, mock speeds, you have your angle of attacks, you have your vertical speeds and you have um, your mass and accelerations. You have altitude readouts in both meters and feet, which is really handy. I use number two for um, ascent because you have your apoapsis and periapsis as well as dynamic pressure, um, which you can use for the uh, scramjets. And three is typically used for atmospheric flight. You know, you've got normal things like altitude and feet, heading, dynamic pressure and PSI, uh, velocity and miles per hour, and Mach. Interesting that we don't use um, knots at all. And you also have your uh, latitude and longitude. So uh, setting four is typically used for um, RCS. So if I turn on the jet, you'll see a fluctuation here. This is pounds of force coming out of the jets. Uh, five is the normal on-orbit display. So when lights are on, everybody home, that kind of thing. 
Um, that's what I use it for. Now if I turn the HUD off, this last button here that says Data HUD, if I press and hold that, oh, it's not showing up for some reason. I guess it's because I turned the HUD off. There we go. What this does is it shows you all the different controls that you can do with the craft. So these are the plethora, the absolute plethora of um, key commands that this craft has. I haven't even memorized half of them. But if you need to refer to it, click and hold that one. And then release it when you're done. Uh, air flight control services are here. RCS mode is here. Rotation. You'll notice that Sally Beaumont reads that, not the obnoxious rotation. Off. Uh, if you try and turn air flight control surfaces on while the APU is off, we'll get an error. Okay, maybe not. I thought we did. You just can't turn it on. However, um, if you try and move the elevator trim. APU offline. There you go. All right, now we're on to the bottom panel. So I'm not going to delve into this, but here, here's your vessel limitations on this side. Dynamic pressures, I told you about that. Um, here's your touchdown rates. Here's your deployment times. Uh, same controls up on top for your mains, your hover, and your scramjets. When you're connected and you want to undock, you press that button. I got an error because I'm not docked. Um, this is your uh, fuel flow. I must have skipped that. Yeah, I totally skip this section of the middle panel so um, both are here though this is the um, specific fuel consumption of the scramjets lower values are better that basically means that you're being more fuel efficient uh, your flow is how much um, fuel is being burned in kilograms per second in the scramjets higher numbers are better because it means that you're accelerating faster uh, you also have, uh, in the Concorde, they have what's called center of gravity shift. Uh, this is done by pumping the fuel between the different tanks. In the case of the XR2, we can do it in a matter of seconds. Um, you can turn it on auto mode or Warning. manually adjust center it. center of gravity shift offline. But you need the hydraulics in order to do it. Warning, so that's center of gravity shift offline. That. Okay. You can cross feed between the different tanks. Cross feed off. Cross feed off. In this case, we're full, so um, you can't do anything. But if you turn the cross feed to main, you'll pull um, fuel out of your RCS and put it in your main. If you turn it to RCS, you'll pull fuel out of your main tank and put it in your RCS tank. If you're too heavy, you can do a fuel dump. So you click and hold. Warning, fuel dump. And you'll get a warning that you're basically dumping a ton warning, of fuel, fuel out dump. through these ports here. It's wasteful. Warning, fuel dump. But you you have a maximum landing weight, and if you if you have to be under that weight, you have to do a dump. So now I can just. Uh, Show this if, if I think that I need more RCS, I want to top that off. I change the cross feed to RCS. Cross feed RCS. And now you'll see the RCS tank is going up, the main's going down. Cross feed off. And if we turn it the other way, it'll pull from RCS put cross main. Cross feed main. And when it fills, it should automatically turn off. Main fuel tank's full. And there you know why we've turned off. Okay. So I mentioned the supply lines before. So um, you, it, it may look like that you can just turn these on, right? No external line pressure. But you can't. Um, the reason you can't is because your hatches are actually here. 
Same three timers, those are not different. Same system warning system. Reset. No difference there. You can turn your APU on and off here. By the way, this APU tank level indicator, which is here and here, is also found here. You can dump all of your tanks. This is your uh, external line pressures. So this basically says if there is an uh, if the fuel pump is connected and you're ready to accept fuel, which we're not right now, we have to open the hatches. So I can actually open the fuel hatch by pressing this button. Fuel hatch open. All right, now watch the line Refueling pressures. Refueling systems online. They're not online until they turn green. Even though she says fuel systems online, you do not have sufficient external line pressure until these go green. Once they're green, you can now fill the tanks. So I can try filling the APU. Well, first the scram. Scram fuel tanks full. But the scram's full. So let's try the main. Main fuel tanks full. Main fuel tank is full too. But what about the RCS? I have to fill the RCS tank. There is no way to fill the RCS tank directly. Cross you feed have to do a crossfeed onto the RCS first and fill your RCS tank to the brim before you can accept main fuel. And it fills very fast. RCS fuel tanks full. Here comes the main fuel, and you'll see this fluctuate a bit as we accept main fuel. Main fuel tanks full. And that's it. So now uh, I can fill the APU tank as well. APU fuel tanks full. And what about this one? No external line pressure. We'll get to that. Refueling systems offline. Oh, yeah. Fuel hatch Watch. open. Let me demonstrate this real quick. Watch what happens if she says online. But Refueling systems, no online. external line pressure. See? APU fuel tanks full. Need the green lights. All right, so outside, I mentioned it, fuel hatch. That's what it looks like. It's red. Refueling systems offline. Okay, liquid oxygen. Liquid Locked oxygen hatch, hatch open. opening up. And that's what it looks like. It's blue. Locks resupply systems online. Again, wait for it to go green. And over here. Locks tanks full. You can refill liquid oxygen. Locks resupply systems offline. So here we've got an angle of attack indicator that's the same as the one above and a backup slip indicator that's the same as uh, this one. There's a lot of redundancy in this craft. Uh, you can do a lock stump if you want to. It doesn't hold much weight though, uh, but this is your liquid oxygen tank uh, in percentage. Here's the uh, a full percentage readout to five digits. I don't know how you could ever make a tank that could possibly know the amount of fuel in it to five digits. I mean, most modern spacecraft don't even know their fuel to within 1%. And that's not them not being able to keep track. It's just, you just can't really measure liquid in space all that well. So this is the total amount of days that we can travel until we're empty. So if, if we seal up the craft and leave the atmosphere, we have 2,563 days, 10 hours, 13 minutes, and 20 seconds before the oxygen runs out. There is one crew member aboard, which means if there's two crew members aboard, that goes in half. If there's the full 14 crew members aboard, you divide this number by 14, and that's the time you can spend in space. That's just letting you know that your cabin oxygen level is 20.9%. That's a readout, not a setting value. So if that gets down to zero, you know there's a serious problem. Uh, and you're about to die. So, hull thermal limits are here. So this is where you start turning white. Um, wow, 2800 C. That's like 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, wing loads. So... Again, I had said watch the wing load when you're coming out of um, re-entry. Those are your limits. You exceed them, the craft will um, break off. And these are your line pressures that you're expecting. Um, okay. 
system status display same thing that's here same thing that's here if your radiator is deployed you'll get a light here why is there a radiator light here besides for redundancy well let me in introduce you to this this is the coolant tank right so this is to cool the engine right no there's no engine it's to cool the computers why do we care about cooling the computers you know it's a server room they just call it a server outage well the problem is those servers control the oxygen flow which means if there's a server outage there's an oxygen outage and that's not good um, you start running low on oxygen it'll be like five nights at Freddy's 3 you start like blanking and stuff and then uh, all of a sudden you know a animatronic howl comes up from the from the airlock um, actually uh, if you can see here the door is open this is actually open to below which means if I was like if I took my drink out of my uh, cup holder here and started drinking it and then uh, accidentally dropped it off my lap guess what it's going all the way down here I, I don't I'm not sure I like that design uh, if I bought an XR2 Raven star in real life uh, I would probably install a net there to try and like stop things from dropping okay um, so when you're on the ground to keep them cool you keep this external cooling uh, online when you're ready to go you shut it off external cooling offline but you'll notice that the temperature's going up and the temperature will continue going up when you reach uh, 110 that's when your oxygen starts going out um, down and your hallucinations going up so when you're on the ground open that external cooling hatch when you were in space open that external cooling um, you can't uh, open the external cooling hatch when you're docked you can open the external cooling hatch but when you're free in space not landed you can't open your external cooling hatch which means instead of using the external cooling hatch you open the radiator you can actually open the radiator on the ground too if you want to and that will cool you twice as fast like let's say you're in the red and that's a really bad position to be in because you're kind of damaging your systems but you're not going to die i open both and get that coolant to come down as quickly as possible now, if you're doing an atmospheric flight up around 40,000 feet, if you go slow enough, you should be able to open the radiator because the radiator um, is actually uh, parallel to the airstream. So if you're going slow enough, you can open the radiator and fly through the atmosphere without too much prob too many problems just know that you need to keep your speeds on the slower speed on the slower side like aircraft now if you look the radiator is not as efficient as the external cooling hatch so in fact it's not really going anywhere your APU affects how quickly you it cools so if I turn the APU offline once it's off you should notice that it's coming down so that's just the note. The APU generates a ton of um, heat. So when the APU is on and your external cooling hatch is shut and your radiator is shut, you need to be getting to space or landing because you're going to run out of um, air. Okay, I don't think I mentioned this before, but there are um, turbo packs that you can uh, fly around with in your UMMUs. They basically allow you to fly really really fast like let's say I'm in space and there's no ground here and I have a space station I want to fly to and it's like there we go there it is right there and it's like 10 10 miles out well using a using the super powerful jetpack I can fly um, way out to where I want to go So I'll deploy one, and it should be on the ground uh, somewhere. Yes, there it is, right there. So basically, uh, it's like a wingsuit. You put it on, and then you can blast around everywhere. 
I don't know how powerful it is because I actually don't use them all that often. Um, just because I'm not normally in a mission configuration where I need to use one. I think the Kara pack is red and um, you put Stowall to bring them back in and the Lee pack is blue. There's only two of them. Uh, actually, no, both of them are red. But they basically fit on the back of your spacesuit and uh, they're pretty cool. Okay, bring that back on board. All right, the fourth and final panel is the payload camera panel. So if I do payload camera view, now this is the fourth camera. It is a mast camera that's um, from on top of the, the craft. This is also a really handy swivel camera. It's kind of like a periscope. In fact, it might not be a camera, it could be a periscope. Um, very handy for looking at around. This is the non-cheaty external view so if you want to be realistic and not do like these kinds of views that you can't do in space, you could probably get away with this one and say that it's realistic. Uh, a lot of great views here, especially if your nose cone closed and you're like re-entering onto Earth or Mars or something. Looks really awesome. But anyway, here's the true purpose of this thing. Click on this button, it launches your payload editor. So this payload editor allows you to, when you're on the ground, select and load platforms. So let's say that we're going on a super, super, super long trip. We're gonna go to Jupiter and then we're gonna go to Saturn. Um, we're gonna go see Io and then we're gonna go to Europa and then we're gonna go to Jupiter low Earth orbit and then we're going to fly down into Saturn really quickly and then we're gonna go visit Titan and then we're gonna go to Enceladus. Well, we might run out of fuel. So what do you do when you run out of fuel? You bring more fuel with you. So I pick a payload that I want and choose a slot that I want to put it in. It will fit, if you note the dimensions here, uh, these are the different slots and these are the payload dimensions, which means it will not fit slot one. Even though slot one is bigger, it has to fit precisely. Uh, you can't have things banging around in the trunk, so it has to fit perfectly. I can load it into two or three, cannot load it into one. If I try and load it into one, I'll get an error message. So I can put it into two. And now this is extra fuel. If I return, if I close the payload editor and return to the upper panel view and come down, you'll note it's really hard to see, but if you look at the main fuel meter, there is now a darker green kind of like a sea green on the right side and our main fuel tank is now at 16,000 kilograms which is not what it was before so we actually have considerably more fuel on board we can go for a longer mission but I'm not done yet act now and we'll throw in the extra super cool scram fuel so with all this extra fuel it's going to be extra weight, which means getting to orbit is a little bit harder. So if I load an extra scram tank in, now we're in business. That means that um, we can use the scram tank fuel, and as soon as we run out, we jettison it into space, and then we use the next main fuel. Now, um, we don't normally burn that much scram fuel though, so you need to carry something else with you, like a crew habitation module. So you'll note I said that there's a door here, and that door goes um, straight into the cargo bay, which currently is vacuum. However, if we hook it up and install it, now those two have connected and in here there's going to be bunks there's gonna be uh, a kitchen there's gonna be a bathroom so yeah if you're going on a really long flight this is the setup you want you want a crew habitation module you want an extra fuel tank uh, and you want a um, scramjet tank and now we weigh a hundred and five thousand pounds as heavy as a light rail train 
Now I'm going to remove all of them for a second. Um, empty bay, there we go. And instead, I'm going to install this UCGO Platform 1, and it only fits into bay 2. You can't put it into 1 or 3. You can only carry one for flight. But basically what this allows you to do is fit universal cars and cargo materials that I think I briefly talked mm -hmm. about in um, in uh, the case of the Delta Glider 4. So if I load up a UCGO cargo real quick, like um, I can do space fuel for instance. If I create a space fuel Okay, that was unintentional. And um, set it to be on the ground under my uh, XR2. Then we can load it into uh, this along with six other payloads. And you don't need to fill it up. That's complicated enough that we're going to go to another episode for that. I can't go through that now. So... When, you're, um, when you've got a payload, you can select it, and it'll give you information about it. So this is what it looks like when it's full. Uh, it gives you its name, its dimensions. Uh, you'll notice the dimensions are a little bit different. It fits the entire bay. That's why you can't put anything in here. Um, and if you notice this deploy too, this basically shows you where it's going to go to. If you do a deploy, and what that basically does is payload deploy crane, and you can only do that when you select it. Mm. And let's see, that I think that went to yeah, there it is. So it's sitting there. Um, now, when a payload is nearby, you can actually grapple it. So if there's targets in range, you can go through here. And um, if I want to get a payload, what I will do is select and then uh, do grapple, and if I do set range, that basically controls away how far I want to pull it in, into the payload bay. latched in bay. But there's only so much I can do. So now it's loaded. Uh, that's the way it would be done in a real hangar. Um, that's pretty much it. You've got your payload mass here, so this is payload only, and this is the entire ship mass here. Close the payload editor. Return to the upper panel view and the main panel view. So that's it. That's the entire XR2 Raven Star. Um, those are all its functionalities. Of course, I didn't get to demonstrate them all, but I have basically talked about everything. Possible I could have missed something or two, but um, I'm pretty sure I hit everything. So if you guys have questions, uh, go ahead and um, send me a comment. Uh, I'll try and answer it. There's a big, like, 120-page manual that lists all of this out for you. Um, so give that a read if you want. I've been Dr. Aeronautics, and I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.